I'm Amy Holthouse, President of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce and your host for Chamber Chat. Thank you for joining us today. Our guests are the Bowman family from Bow Bowman Superior Genetics and so I welcome you all to the set today. Thank you for taking time. I know you're very busy. We appreciate you being here. Um, introducing Philip Bowman and your wife Linda. Thank you for being here and your son Luke and then your daughter Lindsay Sank Lindsay Bowman Sankey. I had that backwards. So we're so thrilled that you could be here to share your story and tell us more about what's happening out in Western Wayne. Sure. So I know it's a big family production out there. We had our farm tour out there and celebrated with you in that evening. But if you could share a little more with our viewers about how Bowman Superior Genetics came to be and how you all work together. and Thank you very much for the invitation. We're happy to be here and make a make the community aware of what goes on in uh, Greens Fork, uh, Wayne County, Indiana, that a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, <clears throat> Bowman Superior Genetics is, a, uh, is a, uh, a beef cattle operation that started out as a small dream, and I'll let Lindsay expand on that shortly, but uh, it started out as a small project, and uh, with the enthusiasm and help of my son, uh, we've turned that into Superior Genetics. And so uh, we're going to share some of that story with you today. It's fascinating. I just know little bits and pieces, so I'm anxious to hear it again so I can grasp some more for myself as well. Sure. Well, I think the, the passion and the background of Bowman Spear Genetics started back in the 1960s. And I'll be honest that um, agriculture education and FFA plays a big role in where our family is today operating Bowman Superior Genetics um, because it was in the 1960s that dad got to go to the Chicago stockyards with his FFA advisor and a few other classmates. And it was there that he learned about uh, quality beef production and the, the big beef breeds back at that time, which were shorthorn cattle. Angus cattle and also Herefords and and dad went home and learned a lot about that in his own time and then um, as uh, his FFA years progressed he had the opportunity to to gain a, a shorthorn heifer from a local farmer and in repayment for that heifer dad was to return the first born heifer calf off of that cow what would become wow. a cow well, the project maybe didn't turn out so well because the heifer that dad chose ended up going through several fences and um, got to be oh. more of a, an unruly heifer than I think dad and his father and his, his mother and siblings had planned. And so um, it ended up that unfortunately before that heifer turned into a cow and had her first baby calf, dad had to return that heifer to the oh. local farmer. So it was kind of an FFA project that didn't turn out, and we've all had that disappointment in our life. But sure. from that point, Dad said if he's ever in a position to spend some money, he was going to buy a shorthorn cow, and he was going to build a fence, and he was going to do, do it right. That's and wonderful. So that I think was, it's fascinating, too, that you were turned on and excited about farming in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that, well, that <laughs> that's used to be. That's not a typical story from where I That's where the stockyards used to be that's in this great. region. Yeah, it was huge. That's fantastic. Yeah. And unfortunately now, those stockyards aren't there. There's a, a memorial site of where they used Aww. to be, but they no longer stand. But, um, yeah, and uh, back... So what kind of fence did you build the second time around? <laughs> well, That's my question. Well, I think the key, the key thing was that when I was young, we didn't have the facilities we have today. Sure. But um, more important is when I got that heifer, it was about a 650, 700-pound calf that really hadn't been around anybody. And so when you try to contain it and take away from its contemporary group, it just was a bit unruly. And so, <laughs> how big they are. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a big so, animal. <laughs> yes. So, but that, she was still a calf, but, but, uh, and she had never had a halter on her head, so oh, it was wow. a very, uh, a very, without the facility, it was very sure. taxing on her and I. Yeah, I would so, imagine. Yeah. Quite a learning process. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so when you when they're born in your place and you help them from day one, they know you. It's yeah. a different animal, a different temperament, and, and the, the whole work. So you begin yeah. to build that relationship from the time that animal physically hits the ground. You know yeah. that's when animal husbandry starts for us now, taking care of that calf. But unfortunately for Dad, back at that time, he bought it later in its in its calfhood. So. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got around, and I didn't mean to interrupt your story, to getting that second chance, what did that look like at that point? Where were you in your education? And Well, 
uh, family. At that point, I was a married man to this lady over here, <laughs> and uh, you know she came from a from a dairy farm, so she was fond of the animals as well. And she knew I wanted uh, shorthorn cattle at some point, so the time came when we could buy some ground and and uh, bought three cows from a local a local farmer, uh, three shorthorn cows, and that was the beginning of what's turned into be quite a project. I would and, say. Uh, yeah. Quite yeah. the project, yeah. quite the project. Yeah. I love the way that the that the farm has grown and you've kept it in the family and you're all connected and doing your different roles and... Um, it certainly just, is a family affair. I mean, yeah. uh, even when we don't feel the best, uh, Linda goes with me to the farm nearly every morning mm -hmm. and helps me feed and water and, and uh, take care of the, the morning chores before I go to work. And then I think many times she stays out there or goes back out later, depending on the weather. If it's really, really cold, we can't leave the tanks of water totally full because they'll freeze. Yeah. So she'll go back through the day and fill tanks and let them drink a bit, you know. And uh, wow. it's, a, it's a project, but uh, it's kind of a, a way of life for us. And what's special about shorthorn cattle? Why is that the direction you went? Is that good for this region or that was just your first love? Or what was it that kept you in that area? Well, shorthorn cattle used to be the most dominant cattle in the U.S. I mean, they, they were the cattle of, of, uh, that everybody had. Uh, they're very docile animals. They've actually been used for, in the place of an oxen, as an oxen for, for work. Um, they're, uh, they're a uh, high marbling animal for uh, high quality meat. They have high quality carcass. And uh, so it's uh, been something that I've uh, taken interest in in the beginning and, and stayed with it and happy that I have. Yeah. Sounds like it's been very positive. Uh, it was a good choice in the long run. Oh, well, I think so. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. they're also very maternal. So, of course, maternal it means the same thing to us that they take very good care of their calves and they also have um, great milk production. So, do you do any milking or are you just about beef production out? No, we have beef shorthorn cattle, so mm -hmm. there are milking shorthorns, which mm -hmm. is a very um, small percentage of what a shorthorn might be considered, but there are milking shorthorns, and that has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the cattle that we produce. Okay. Ours are um, um, mainly f or completely for beef production. Um, when I say they produce milk, that is only for their, their calves. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Interesting enough, uh, when Linda's father uh, was a young man, he milked milking shorthorn. Yeah, so I mean, really? I mean, it was a dominant wow. breed in, uh, years wow. ago, and so it's uh, it's making a resurgence today. And, and mm -hmm. uh, we've we've uh, I don't want to say we've been a pioneer, but we've been steadfast in keeping the name out there, and, and we've done a lot to, yeah. I believe, in, improve the herd from where it had di digressed to to where it's coming back from, going back to. Well, and one thing I know we learned on the farm tour, I mean, it is very high tech at your farm. There is a lot of research and, and things going on that are helping you just to continue to grow into a better and better farm with a better herd. And it was fascinating to me all that goes on out there that's technology based. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the technology and, and a lot of the uh, genetic selection again comes from Luke and his uh, exposure to college and, mm -hmm. and different, different things uh, as, as, I, as I basically have stayed on the farm. Uh, Luke has uh, gotten out and seen more than I have and has brought those ideas home, which has been very helpful. Okay. Well, it's a wonderful story, and we're just thrilled to get to know your family and learn more about your farm and everything that you're doing. And I know you all contribute greatly with your heart, your soul, your time, your energy, and it's just, it's really been a pleasure and a privilege to learn more about it. Um, I think we'll take a small break, and then we'll come back and hear some more from Luke about specifics of his expertise. Thank Pretty you. Pretty good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. We're back with the Bowman family, learning more about Bowman Superior Genetics in Greens Fork, Indiana. Thank you for joining us. I have Luke Bowman and Philip Bowman with me again for this segment. We're going to get into some more nitty gritty details about your expertise and and share with us maybe how many how many cattle head do you have on the farm? Well, uh, initially when, when mom and dad decided to get into production agriculture into the beef business, we started out with just three head. Uh, that was for 4-H projects for Lindsay and I. And then our older sister, Laura, who's often on the farm as well, she mm -hmm. wasn't able to be here today. 
and uh, it, it grew and it started and, and we started to use new technologies that we learned at Purdue University and such on uh, artificial insemination to superior animals. Um, we used embryo transplant technology to get a critical mass, a larger base herd of cows, which we're now up to about 125 mature mama cows. Wow. So we'll have about 125 <laughs> baby calves every year. Yeah. I have trouble with two children. Yeah. <laughs> 125. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's so, amazing growth. And over what period of years did that transformation take place? How long did that take? Basically from 1994 with the original three until about, uh, I think we hit our high point in probably 2013. And we've wow. stayed right there, yeah. That is not a very long time, really, to grow that much. No. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, and there's always, Purdue. There's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's always a lot that leave every year. So, I mean, that's just sure. what we've maintained. Yeah. 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 So for the, the ones that leave and then you're able to grow the mass right. on top well, of it that. Was, we were able to, to acquire and then also rent uh, neighboring pasture fields. Mm -hmm. um, to you know, to, okay. so we could expand. I mean, we didn't just start with one large chunk of ground, or we don't overgraze yeah. by any means. But it's it is a it is a we've been lucky. We can expand because of uh, the opportunities around us. Sure, yeah. we well, have a fabulous location. I know on the tour, part of the tour, we did some touring on the buses and yeah. drove to see the different sites. And although you're close, you do have quite a bit of land, mm -hmm. which is I'm sure incredibly helpful. Yeah, so you bet. That's good. It's neat that you're all out there together. Um, Tell us a little bit more about the meat. Okay, um, the the beef side of our business is 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 kind of the turnkey and important part. We are seed stock, so we do sell lots of genetics. Um, Dad sells uh, genetics to producers all over the United States and Can Canada and even Australia, New Zealand. Um, wow. And that's and that's specifically because of the genetics we offer, because they're phenotypically attractive cattle, but more specifically the beef quality. Mm -hmm. So. Um, by using superior animals or superior genetics through artificial insemination and embryo transfer, um, we're able to develop this critical mass of calves. Uh, my brother-in-law, Cody, who could not be here today, um, helps evaluate which animals will go back into reproduction and, and will be parent seed stock later, and which ones we will send uh, to western Iowa. And we have a large feedlot custom feed those cattle for us, and then they collect all the harvest data after the animals are slaughtered and let us know how our genetics are competing on the national average for beef quality. And we have done tremendously well in having some of the most highly profitable cattle of all breeds um, in the past five or six years that we've done that. So it's been very rewarding. Well, that's amazing. Congratulations, number well, one. Um, it's quite an accomplishment um, to share. And then I think you know, for your families and for the future of your children and going forward, you have such a great established pathway for, you know, learning to keep the best and, and share the best and, and just quality all the way around is improving because of what you're doing well, right here. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, a lot of our, our beef, uh, most of our beef goes to Tyson and they'll pay a premium for that because it'll go into some of their high-end restaurants mm -hmm. or chains that they'll use to distribute food to or high-end product at the grocery stores. But Dad also sells plenty of freezer beef here to the local area mm -hmm. to, to, uh, you know, to kind of uh, get to know other folks in the community but also educate the community on what we do so they can mm -hmm. come and select the animal that they want to um, you know, experience uh, farm fresh, locally grown beef. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. But maybe for those who, who aren't fortunate enough or don't have the connection yet to purchase straight from your dad, what do we look for when we're buying our beef? What's a, what's a good piece of beef look like? Um, the really important part about beef that a lot of people do the exact opposite of is understand what marbling is. And marbling are the white flecks of fat that mm -hmm. are on the inside of the steak not the fat on the outside. Okay. The fat on the outside is what we call intermuscular fat, which is spelled with an E-R, intermuscular fat, and that means across, and that's okay. the fat on the outside. That's not a real healthy fat. Marbling is intramuscular fat, spelled with an R-A, and that's the, fle the, the flex of fat on the inside of the steak. They have a different uh, molecular buildup, and actually marbling is a pretty healthy fat. Hmm. It's got some, some positives in it. Okay. And marbling accounts for the juiciness tenderness and really the flavor of a steak. Okay. So a lot of people try to avoid marbling. They just want that solid red piece of meat they see in the meat counter. Uh -huh. But what That's makes it high the quality is the one that has the flex of meat or the flex of fat on the inside. Yeah. yeah. Well, and when we go to these high-end restaurants and we purchase a steak, we don't 
most of the time you don't see it before they cook it. So right. you don't really right. know what the best right. piece of meat looks right. like. Right, right. <laughs> well, if you go to the grocery store, you know, that's where a lot of we yeah. see. I, every time I go to uh, one of the local groceries and folks are looking at their meat and they grab that one piece of meat that's really bright red and not much marbling, I just, I tell them now, make sure you don't cook. I, I, I have a, I have a, yeah, I can't help but talk to them about it. And, I, and because really if it doesn't have much marbling, it's really easy to overcook and, and burn your steak. And so you if you think your dad is not a good chef because he's always burning steak, it might be the meat he's buying rather than his ability to grill. Look, that's right. very interesting because uh, that in, Inter In, intra intra muscular fat marbling, does yeah. it, it it kind of dissolves into the meat as you're yeah, cooking it it, is it that, turns fluid mm -hmm. yep and okay. now this, the the fat on the outside that everybody's worried about which is the unhealthier stuff sure the unhealth that's yeah the the different fat okay. but the the marbling which it looks like flecks of marbling like on a floor mm -hmm. um, is the good is the good, good product good. and we have a great uh, example here some information that you brought that we'll put up for folks to see yeah um, and certainly they can contact us. We'll take a few of those back to the sure. office if they want one, and we yeah. can get people buying the right meat. You bet. Yeah. So yeah. anything else special that you want to share with us about it? There's just so much. We could do an hour, I think, and we, we never have enough time. Um, we're just thrilled to learn more and more about your family and all that you're doing. Um, is there anything else you want to share with us? or? Uh, I, I would say that uh, s since we've really began to grab a hold of this and, and go, we've uh, Luke and I have gone to Canada, I think, three times, and it seems like every time we go, we bring back a bull. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, but it's been a good move because we've sure. bought back some of the better bulls in, the, in the North America that, wow. that walk on the farms in Greens Fork, Indiana. And uh, they've paid dividends. And uh, it's it's also a very enjoyable trip to go up and uh, look at the big country, but uh, but we're after we're after genetics when we go to Canada. Yeah, yeah. our our uh, the commerce dad's being very humble that he's getting in terms of interest is is globally as well. We mm -hmm. send genetics to Western Canada. Um, we've we've been selling genetics to Australia, New Zealand recently. We've had some inquiry from uh, South Africa, so and and Brazil. So actually, it's uh, that's my favorite part is a lot of folks don't really know where we're at. Not a lot of people travel south of Greens Fork. Sure. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we, we uh, he does have quite a uh, a global presence. Well, and I think that's phenomenal. We were just at the economic forum this morning out right here on campus at IU East, and they were talking about you know it's not a huge huge percentage of our total marketplace for the United States, but it's a critical piece that we are global and that we are sharing things aside from retail goods mm -hmm. um, with our global market and how, how important that is for our growth, not only as Wayne County, but as a region and as a country. And so uh, it's just incredible to me that, that, that you're doing that right out of Greens Fork yeah. and doing it well. So well, thank you. Congratulations and continue that work. We'll be excited to hear an oh, update. We plan to. Yeah, <laughs> we plan to. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. good. So, good. I uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank the Chamber of Commerce, Wayne County Chamber of Commerce, for uh, asking us to uh, sponsor the or to to host the uh, the farm tour. It was a lot of work, but it it uh, was uh, very gratifying and uh, and very happy to share what we do with the community. Well, thank you all. Uh, Lindsay, of course, is on our agriculture committee at the chamber. And when we started talking about bringing the farm tour back to the chamber, um, she spoke right up with interest. And I know your family all jumped right in. And, and we know you did a lot of work in preparation. It was a phenomenal tour. We had upwards of 150 to 175 people out there that evening. And it was just fantastic to see the excitement and the range of participants that yeah. came, children yeah. through yeah. mature adults, yeah. and uh, really it's just um, such an important part of our history and of our county. Um, I think it's fantastic that you were willing to um, take that time and energy to share with us. So, thank you. I'm glad so for you're it. welcome, but thank you too. You bet. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you for being here, and thank you again to Lindsay and to your wife Linda for taking time and coming out, and, and to the rest of your family for all that you're doing for Wayne County. We're just really proud to have you here as part of what we're doing as a community. So. Yep. Well, we we think we're just started. I yeah. think you are yeah. too. It sounds yeah. like you have a long way to go. So. Yep. Yeah. 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 Good luck.
Joining me now are Melissa Vance and Trevor Okerson from the Chamber. Hi guys. Hi, thank Hello. you for having Thank you for joining me. What a great visit with the Bowmans. They are fabulous. They are wonderful people. Wonderful. And the farm tour was the best we've had in ages and so, so informative to everyone who attended. Yes. I think it's fantastic. Not only the technology, but the global reach. The things that they're doing on their farm are wonderful. Absolutely. Which leads us right into Chamber Annual Dinner. Would you like to share a little bit more about what's going on? This year is going to be so exciting, as it always is, but talking about global reach, we really, as um, a committee and also with Kathy Cruz Uribe, who is our incoming board chair, sat down and, and started thinking about Wayne County and that global reach that we have, and as a result, came up with the title to our annual dinner this year, which is Local Talent global reach. Fantastic. And it's so true. We have so many different ways that we're reaching out across the world with our businesses right here in Wayne County. We sometimes get, I think, tunnel vision and just see what we see. And we have no idea that element of what's going on right here in mm -hmm. Wayne County with, you know, many businesses, Holland Colors, Hills, Belden, you name it over and over again, sure. companies working with other other countries around the world. Absolutely. Well, and with Kathy Cruz Uribe coming in as our board chair for 2016, we also have exciting information with who our speaker will be, which I think feeds right into this. Our local talent, homegrown, um, people who are viewing education in new ways and using their talents in different ways, and so, you know, what better to have as our speaker than... <laughs> President McRobbie from IU Bloomington will be here, and we're so excited to hear what he has to say and, and how he can just kind of speak to the crowd and, and address the issues that are going on and encourage our community. Yes. I think it will be wonderful. We have a lot of IU alums in this community and I think mm -hmm. that it will be great. Tickets will be on sale um, soonish and they will probably sell out very quickly. Absolutely. And alongside that of course our executive committee met and poured through the nominations which thank you to the community. We once again had a stack of fabulous nominations mm -hmm. for all of our awards. Every year I'm just continually thrilled with the time and energy that people put into that process um, to recognize that, you know, not necessarily their own business. They're usually nominating someone else across town or, right. or someone that they work alongside. And it's just fantastic to hear the stories um, that come with the nominations. And often we receive multiple nominations for one place or one person. Um, so the nominating committee uh, from the executive group went through all of those and of course has determined who our winners will be. Uh, those winners will individually be contacted soon and we'll be thrilled to share, uh, of course, with the community who those winners are in January at the dinner. Right. It's really neat to see, I think, leaders just r rising up. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look around, you see leaders in our community rising up, and it's not because they want that recognition. It's because they care about the community, and I think that makes all the difference in those mm -hmm. nominations that are read and submitted and, and the people that will be recognized. We were very lucky. It was a very competitive year, so our executive operating committee had a very difficult time making some of those choices. They truly did. <laughs> so we're very excited. I think that they're some of the best winners we've got. Yes, looking forward to that whole evening. Is there anything else from a, a design or a, uh, interest perspective from the committee that you'd like to share uh, looking forwards to the dinner? Or I think there needs to be some element of surprise, so we won't tell all of our secrets today, but the um, ACES Committee, which is the Awards, Celebrations, and Events Committee of the Chamber, is um, already working to put together some really neat things. I think as people arrive that evening, there will be um, that wow moment 
I hope. Yeah. But it's been fun to kind of take take a hold of this theme and kind of run with it. The Save the Date cards will be in the mail by the end of the month, so people should be looking for those, and then invitations will come later in December. Okay, fantastic. So for those who are watching, the Chamber Annual Dinner will take place on Friday, January 22nd. Watch for the Save the Date cards and more information to come soon. We'll be looking forward to sharing with you who those winners are for the Annual Dinner Awards. And don't forget, local talent, global reach. Thank you for joining us for Chamber Chat this month, and we appreciate your watching and support for the Wayne County Area Chamber.